Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Julie Womack, and I'm an assistant professor here at the Yale School of Nursing. And on behalf of everyone on the Scholars Day Committee, I'd like to welcome all of you to YSN Scholars Day. Uh, we're so pleased that so many of you could come. I hope that all of you have been able to register, you've gotten some lunch, and you were able to wander through some of the posters that we have out there. Um, these posters will be up throughout the afternoon. We'll have a short break in the afternoon. You can take a look at them again then. And we have a wine and cheese reception afterwards, and they'll be in the hub where lunch was, and the posters will still be up during that time period as well. A couple of housekeeping notes. Please complete the evaluation form that's in your packets if you're interested in getting continuing education. If you complete this as the afternoon goes along, at the very end, at the desk where you registered, uh, you can turn this in in exchange for your continuing education certificate. Um, if you could also please um, turn off your cell phones or put them on, you know, vibrate, that would be great so we don't disrupt the speakers. In keeping with today's theme of team research, I'd like to quickly acknowledge the various team members without whom this celebration of YSN scholarship would not have been possible. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank my team members on the Scholars Day Committee, Mary Bartlett and Jessica Coviello, uh, Carl Mingus and Robin Whittemore from the DNP program. Uh, huh? From the PhD program, I'm sorry. My brain is one place and I'm reading someplace else. Um, Holly Kennedy, Melissa Pucci, and Nancy Redeker. We all also had amazing administrative support from Fran Hackerman. Uh, the doctoral student colloquium was quite generous and helped to fund our wine and cheese gathering. And thanks to Linda Caruso for organizing lunch. Thanks to Megan Riley and Caitlin Sweeney for their outreach and advertising. And particularly for Ma to Megan for her work on the uh, Scholars Day program. Uh, thanks to Chris Farmer, Melissa Nixon, and Catherine Gaynor for helping with poster logistics. And, of course, Neil Green for helping with and facilitating all things technical. Um, most importantly, thanks to all of the students and all of the faculty who worked with them um, for sharing their work with us. And as you can see, we have a wonderful program this afternoon. And to help us put the work that we're going to see into context, um, we're going to start off with a keynote speech from our dean, Margaret Gray. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I do want to share some news for those of you who are interested in our Doctor of Nursing Practice program or who, or who are in the Doctor of Nursing Practice program. Um, this morning I got the official letter by FedEx from um, our crediting body, the Commission for Collegiate Nursing Education, um, telling us that our DNP program is fully accredited for the maximum of five years. So we're really quite happy about that. Now don't get too excited. It also means that we have a report due in two years um, to them to, to tell them we haven't fallen off the wagon and aren't still meeting the essentials and the key elements. Uh, but it's a very good piece of news. We expected it, but until it actually comes in hard copy, one never believes it's real. So, so that's really good news. So I, I think I actually got this job because I'm... I'm the oldest person, not the oldest person here, but um, the oldest faculty member who's been doing team research for the longest period of time. So what I thought I would do today, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, can you hear me? Um, the literature on the progression of team science, I mean, over the course of my career, we went from um, very much intra-professional science, um, so much so that it was seen as a threat um, for nurse, nurse scientists to work with others. Um, I mean, you know, years and years ago when nurses first started to get doctoral degrees, um, they tended to get doctoral degrees in other fields because there was federal money for them to do that. 
then people got really concerned about would we ever really define and understand what nursing science was if our work was infused by the thoughts of the others. Um, and I think what you'll see is that thoughts about team science have evolved a great deal over time. And I'm going to use my own program of research as a way to illustrate that. I'm going to try to leave a couple. I know we started early. I can tell a lot of stories. So Julie, if you'll give me a heads up when I'm starting to get close to time, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, and then what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about how um, we as a profession, and that means um, people with DMPs as well as PhDs um, and master's degrees, need to, to work together to make sure we nurture team science. No. So first, I think it's important to define interdisciplinarity. And interdisciplinarity is any study or group of studies that are undertaken by scholars from two or more distinct disciplines. So that could be nursing and medicine, nursing and psychology, nursing and education, any of those. And, it, and true interdisciplinary work is based on a conceptual model that integrates frameworks. So um, one of the things I, f I hear PhD students struggling with all the time is, oh, I need a nursing framework for my research. Well, one doesn't necessarily need a nursing framework for your research. You need a framework that makes sense of the relationships that you're positing in your, in your work. It uses methods from multiple disciplines. And so a lot of the work that we see today used to be that there was what was called the qualitative, quantitative schism in our field, where uh, people thought if you did statistics, you were better than the people who did worse. And we've gotten over that to the point where most of our research now actually has a mixed method approach um, and not so much you know, a strict quantitative or a strict qualitative <coughs> approach. And then True interdisciplinarity uses the perspectives from all the members of the team, not just um, you know, the nurse collects the data or the nurse wrote the grant. It's you know, we all work together to solve the problems that carry out the research. So um, so my own background, for those of you who don't know, and I apologize for those who do, you know, I came from um, a clinical field. Um, of pediatric diabetes. And in pediatric diabetes, the concept of team care was actually embraced in the mid-1970s and often included medicine, nursing, um, nutrition, uh, psychology, or social work working as a team together. Now, the reality was there was still a captain of that ship. And those of you who've been around nursing a lot know that physicians always thought they were the captain. I don't. Say, I don't think I'll say any more about that. Right now. <laughs> um, and diabetes research that was being conducted, and that there was mostly medical. So it was things like, you know, we have we have a way of treating people with kids with type one diabetes and adults um, with insulin pumps. Well, I was the nurse. Um, data collector for the original studies of using pumps to deliver insulin for kids with type 1 diabetes. There's a great photograph that shows the pump. The original pump is this big. We used to call it the, the great blue brick. And so, you know, when you think about how that care has evolved over time, um, a lot of it had to do with, number one, it worked in a way that we'd never been able to control diabetes before. Uh, but then people started paying attention that if we were going to do this, you can't expect a five-year-old kid to walk around with this thing on the hip like this. Um, and then it eventually evolved into collaborations around other areas. Um, and real psychosocial research, the kind of research that I've done for most of my career, really began to evolve in the mid to late 1980s. So the continuum of interdisciplinarity 
actually goes from single discipline, i.e., this is a nursing study, I'm only going to have nurses on my team, I don't want to think about what anybody else thinks or how anybody else views this question, to what's defined as multidisciplinary, which I, you know, those of you who know kids know the term parallel play, that like you put three kids in a room and they each have their own toy and they don't talk to each other, they just sit there and play together but without interacting. And that's what a lot of early multidisciplinary work was. Like, you know, I would do my research and I might have a physician on my team, but he wasn't very involved in the research piece. Um, and um, so it really was, they did their thing, we did our thing, and, you know, hopefully it came out pretty good. Interdisciplinarity is what I just said, with the sharing of frameworks and a joint plan of what each discipline gives to um, the work and enhances it. And then when we get to transdisciplinary, which is really, you know, the, mo the movement that's happening in science today, it is about the development of taking you know, single disciplinary frameworks and creating new paradigms that have a new language and a new um, approach. And to be perfectly frank, you see it in a couple of areas, but you see it more in areas like um, genomics, like um, some of the new uh, technologies that are being developed in healthcare where it's not you know, a single disciplinary approach applied to um, a particular question, but the need to answer a particular question requires new ideas and completely new um, frameworks. So, um, some, of you, some of you may know these people, but, and, and the sad thing is that we were all a lot younger then. <laughs> um, but this is my long time colleague, Bill Tamberlane, um, who's still here at Yale, and uh, he, he was a fellow when I first um, started working in pediatric diabetes and thought it was insanity that nurse practitioners would come to work in, in chronic illness clinic. Um, he's now changed his mind because his entire clinic is run by seven nurse practitioners. Um, this, this is Sylvia Levides. Sylvia sadly just retired, but she is a social worker. Um, and she was a key part of our interdisciplinary team. This is, of course, me, 20 pounds heavier. And this is Mary Savoy, who is a nutritionist. Mary um, was not part of the original team, but the original, t I couldn't find any photograph um, of uh, the nutritionist whose name was Namaya Abdule. And, um, but I wanted you to get the point that there's, a, and, and there is a, logic to Bill being on the top here because the design was Bill was in charge and we all worked together very collaboratively um, but you know it was the captain of the ship Moss. and um, so this was my first research study it was done when I was a part of that team um, as a student at Yale um, where we conducted one of the first studies to ever look at uh, adjustment in school-age kids, not teenagers um, with type 1 diabetes. And back in those days, which I call the days of veterinary diabetes care because, you know, the technology we have today and the skill with which we can manage diabetes is very different than it was then. And we measured um, glucose control by looking at how much glucose was excreted in the urine over a 24-hour period. You can imagine how much kids loved bringing in their bottles of urine every three months for this. But in any case, what we showed in this paper was that um, on a measure of psychosocial adjustment, people who were more well-adjusted um, had better glucose control than people who um, who had, who recorded being poorly adjusted. Now, you know, this was a sample of 20. Um, it got published in pediatrics. How, how that ever happened, I can't tell you. But 
jobs. There are a lot of people who believe, including me, that this is what got me really hooked on research. Number one, I love doing the project, but number two, I loved seeing my name in print. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just a little study, but there it was. But it was, it was made headline because nobody was studying that age group of kids. Everybody assumed they did fine. And um, it was just the teenagers who were, who were in trouble. So then I decided, having fallen in love with research, that I would go get a doctoral degree. So I went off to Columbia with my husband, who was doing a um, postdoc in, in, at NYU. And um, I got very interested in this whole notion of the relationship between the mind and the body and, um, and how stressors work in kids, et cetera. And um, so for my dissertation, I did a study uh, looking, it's following a group of kids in the South Bronx. I mean, this is how stupid I was. And, uh, my message to people doing the dissertation, don't do this. <laughs> don't go to a really difficult place to do your research. Don't do a longitudinal study. <laughs> I mean, you know, all the things that, that when we tell you we want you to finish, um, I'm here to tell you this was not the brightest decision I ever made. But we did a study where we looked at stressful life events that happened over the year prior um, to a January to June semester, um, and then of stressful events that occurred um, over the course of that spring semester. And we looked at a number of outcomes, including absenteeism, which ended up being very important. The higher the number of stressful events in these kids' lives, the more likely they were uh, to miss school. And it, the difference was about fivefold. Uh, so it was a huge difference in the number of missed school days. And the team uh, for my dissertation committee was, um, I was a student in a school of public health. Um, my primary mentor was a sociologist um, who did um, health-based sociology, uh, a social psychologist, uh, and me. Um, so the, you know, there were a lot of perspectives because there were issues about environment and um, as well as uh, the sort of medical piece that I knew and they didn't know. And that paper got published in the Journal of Pediatric Health. <coughs> so from there I went, um, I moved to the University of Pennsylvania where I taught for 10 years. And the first study I did um, after I got there was now to go back and do what I wanted to do in it initially, which was to study these issues in kids with diabetes. And um, so we did a descriptive survey where we, we followed kids who, at the time, from, we picked up a time of diagnosis, and then we followed them for two years. Um, this was my first NIH grant. Um, it was a mechanism that no longer exists called an R29, uh, which was meant to be the first award that somebody got. Um, not a lot of money, but it gave you five years of support, which was a you know, very nice thing. And then we studied children who were newly diagnosed, and we asked those children to name for us um, a friend who would do the study with them. And what we ended up with, a group of perfectly matched controls. Because their friends were likely their neighbors, lived in the same community, you know, were often at the same you know, exactly the same age, often in this age group of kids were the same gender and, um, you know, obviously were the same age. So um, it worked out quite well. Um, these were kids who were about 11 years of age and slightly less than half were male. They were on two times a day insulin injections. That was the standard at the time. And we did this study in four different diabetes treatment centers. And this is just the one slide I'm going to show you from that, um, where we looked at depressive symptoms from the time of diagnosis to two years post-diagnosis. And what you see here is you see um, in kids with type 1 diabetes, you see higher levels of depressive symptoms right at diagnosis. But that tends to go away over the first six months. 
In the second six months up to 12 months, um, you know, you tend to see a decrease in both groups. And then you start to see an increase in the peers, but look what happens to the kids with diabetes. That they, they have a significantly um, increased rate of high depressive symptoms. And here's the first time you're going to hear me talk about mixed methods. I had a PhD student who was really curious about that phenomenon and did interviews with kids at this 9 to 12 month mark. And what, they, what she found was that this is when reality sets in. You know, people with diabetes, they get diagnosed. They think giving shots is going to be hard. They think testing is going to be hard. That rapidly turns into a routine. And they get, once they get over that routine, and about six to nine months into it or a little bit later, the reality sets in. And... Um, you know, what the kids told us was, and this is their language, so forgive me if you're offended, they call it the oh shit phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That this is like, oh shit, it's for life, it's not the stuff that I thought was going to be hard, it's the day-to-day -day thinking and decision making that I'm going to have to do for the rest of my life. Uh, and that paper was published in Diabetes Care, which is the premier um, clinical research journal in, in diabetes. Now, um, this actually is a real picture of me about 100 years ago. Um, I had more hair. I was thinner. And this is my colleague, Terry Lipman, who um, that's actually a picture from the day she defended her dissertation under my direction. But, and that's her son, who is now a medical student. That tells you how long ago it was. Uh, but she was um, a partner in this research study. She was, at the time, the nurse practitioner associated with one of the pediatric diabetes clinics we were doing this research. And this is not the actual physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but it's close enough because the guy had a beard and all that. <laughs> and um, he's a very famous physician, or physician, but I'm not going to tell you his name. Um, may he rest in peace. Anyway, his view was, you don't do research in my clinic. This could be interesting, but I decide what research gets done in my clinic. And he made it so difficult for me to be able to get into the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is why I had to go to four, four other sites, even though I was working right across an alley from there. Now, the good news is, I've now done, a, he's long gone, and I've done a lot of research for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but um, <coughs> that was a lot what it was like. They controlled the patients, and, you know, you had to genuflect and do all these things to be able to do research. So, um, building on that study, that longitudinal study, we, there were a lot of other pieces to it, and we knew that Diabetes management in teenagers was compromised by adolescent development. We knew as a result of the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, which was a large multi-site clinical trial that was um, finally completed in 1993, that better diabetes control was associated with a reduction in long-term complications, and that primary and secondary control coping was associated with better outcomes. So we got interested in taking what we knew about stress and coping and see, trying to see whether we could develop a way to improve um, how kids with diabetes cope. We developed an intervention or adapted an intervention that had been developed by psychologists to decrease um, kids' use of drugs and alcohol um, and applied it to kids with diabetes um, and the point of coping skills training was to increase the sense of mastery and get rid of these really negative coping behaviors and help them form more positive patterns of behavior. Um, and it uses behavioral and cognitive behavioral approaches uh, in small groups to teach these skills. And these are the skills we taught um, and are still teaching, actually, in newer versions of this. So the first study we did with coping skills training beyond a pilot study 
was a randomized clinical trial of um, kids with type 1 diabetes who were beginning what was then called intensive insulin therapy after the diabetes control and complications trial. We compared it to advanced diabetes education. These were teenagers at entry. They had no other chronic illness and were in the appropriate grade for age. Again, the typical highly controlled randomized clinical trial where you want to you know, decrease variance due to anything else so you can say, if you find the effect, that the effect is due to the intervention. Um, and I have often said that this is the slide that made me famous. It doesn't look that impressive. But this was the first time that any behavioral intervention was shown to have a significant impact on metabolic control. What happened in this study was, now, those of you who know diabetes know that A1Cs of 9 or above are not good. But that was where things were when we started this study in uh, about 1994. And so you see the two groups started about the same time. Um, and the control group, yeah. So the control group and the experimental group got, both got better. But the COVID skills training group got more better, about half a percentage point better, and continued to improve, whereas the control group, the education group, started to get worse. This difference of a full percentage point of um, A1C is equivalent to a 25 to 50% reduction in the potential for long-term complications. And, um, and this was regardless of treatment, whether, whether they were in a pump or um, multiple daily injections. So it, it got, this study actually got a lot of um, attention. And, it, and also, it got some attention because what you see here is quality of life improved in the coping skills training group and didn't change at all, even with intensified treatment. In, um, in the experimental group. So what we showed was hemoglobin A1C improved, quality of life improved, but um, these were group-based sessions. It was nigh on impossible to get teenagers who were out every night, every week, um, every night of the week, you know, with music lessons and sports and this and that and the other thing to come to these group sessions. Um, so we were only ever able to enroll 50% of kids who were eligible, and it was going down over time as kids got busier and busier. And it was also clear that there was no way this could be implemented in clinical practice. It, was, it would take too long um, and obviously would not be covered by methods of care. So we, this, the people who did that study, um, and you see what, we've had a whole different dynamic. It's still Bill and it's still me. Um, and, but I was the PI, he was a co-investigator, and this is Liz Boland Doyle, who graduated from the Yale School of Nursing in 1994, I believe, um, who was a trial coordinator and has gone on to a great career um, in um, not only caring for kids with diabetes, but working in diabetes research as well. And, and you know, the model is a much more collaborative team. Bill was on my team because I was trained in my, in my doctoral program um, as a survey scientist. That's why my early studies were surveys. And I didn't know anything about doing clinical trials. And he's been, he is a very experienced clinical trialist. And uh, so his role was to help me do the best job I could do. So you see it, the dynamics are changing already. So then we needed to, you know, figure out if we could, we're only reaching 50% of the kids who needed this. Um, we also had only done this study at Yale, and um, we were only reaching about 15% of minorities. Um, so um, we then undertook to take this group-based program and turn it into an internet-based program. And we used a multi-phase mixed method approach with focus groups, and we developed a prototype. Um, then we did think aloud interviews where we had um, kids come in, sit down in front of a computer, go through the prototype programs, 
and we sat a research assistant next to them, and they took notes about what the kids had to say. And then, of course, we did a pilot study. Um, and the team for developing this um, was myself and Robin Whittemore, who's here, uh, a group of IT specialists, obviously. I don't, I don't know web programming, and neither did uh, Robin. Uh, a psychologist, a marriage and family therapist, who I have to tell you both, when we first started talking about converting this into an internet-based interventions thought, we had lost our ever-loving minds. But they quickly figured it out. And then a number of um, mostly pediatric um, nurse practitioner students, but other master students who were part of our team over time. This just gives you a sense of what happened with the Think Aloud interviews. The kids really liked it. They liked that there were characters that they could relate to. Um, they, uh, and they had suggestions for us how to make it better. One of the ones was we had these little streaming videos. And the original streaming videos, the voices were done by us. And the kids told us in no uncertain terms that you sat, they, they don't sound like kids, they sound like you. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went out actually and worked with a high school, um, an arts high school, and had kids do the voices. And then each of them got a DVD for part of their, for their acting portfolio, which was mutually beneficial for all of us. So Teen Cope is um, the internet-based coping skills training program, used a graphic novel format, and an asynchronous discussion board so we could somehow replicate um, the group-based work. And then we did a randomized control trial um, comparing Teen Cope to managing diabetes uh, which is an advanced diabetes education program and problem solving program. Um, and we were looking at teens transitioning into adolescence. This is just a picture of the logins for both um, of the programs. This is where kids can develop, you know, create their avatar um, and keep track of what they've done in their sessions. Uh, this is an example of the stress, part of the stress management session. So we had, in this study, we had four clinical sites um, at Yale Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I finally got in. You know. And here's, here's the way you build a team. Um, every one of the PIs in those places were former mentees of mine. So the PI at Children's Hospital was a nurse um, who I actually hired to the faculty of Penn when I was at Penn um, and was now running the pediatric diabetes service. Now I see a nurse who's working in pediatric diabetes. Um, at University of Miami, oops, Alan Dallimater um, is a psychologist in Arizona. Um, so they had, had to be diagnosed at least six months with no major other chronic illnesses. We had 320 kids in the study. So you see the this groups getting bigger. Um, this gives you some basics about their um, demographics and their clinical status. Um, we had very high rates of satisfaction, high levels of participation, and 78% of the kids stayed in the study after 12 months. Now, have, being a person who's clinically worked with adolescents for most of my life, which some of you have heard me say I get sainthood for, it's one thing to work with teenagers. Working with teenagers with diabetes is not the thing. Um, but um, teenagers vote with their feet. They wouldn't do it if they didn't like it. And uh, so we felt good about that. And um, here's the sort of major findings. After 12 months um, where they were in their single group, you see there really wasn't much difference between the two groups on A1C. But um, at 12 months, kids were allowed to cross over. And um, so if you, had cope, if you had teen cope, you could do managing diabetes and vice versa. For people who did one program, um, you know, their A1C started to go up after 12 months. For people who did um, both programs, their A1C got better. Again, about half of, half of a percent, um, which is clinically significant in terms of the potential for reduction of long-term complications. And we had similar results 
with improvement in um, quality of life as well. Um, cost us about two hundred eighty thousand dollars to develop this website. Ongoing costs were relatively low, but we did have um, a part-time person who was the coach and moderator for the discussion board. And the idea is, you know, that here's a way to deliver a program to um, kids at home on their own time. Um, but still has the advantages of interaction with others. Um, so web delivery is feasible. Um, we're now working on ways of looking at what's the best way to do this. We had money from the American Diabetes Association to do a study of, um, this is, by the way, the whole Teen Cope team. This is all the people at Yale. Um, Myself and Robin, um, Sarah's a psychologist, uh, Lauren Liberti is the trial coordinator, she has a degree in public health. We had a social worker um, and an um, athletic trainer and several students who were involved. Kathy Murphy, who's a person at Ch Children's Hospital, and Sue Dumser, who is the most amazing nurse data collector known to humanity. She should, we should clone her and figure out how she does what she does. Melissa Faulkner was at the University of Arizona uh, with a psychology student and a master's student in nursing, and Ellen Delamater, who is a psychologist, and Jennifer Hernandez, who was um, a PhD student in his um, program at Miami. So now what we're doing, we have Teens Connect, which is Teen Cope and Managing Diabetes. Um, we've just finished um, recruitment and are about to finish with data collection of a study um, where we're testing the use of a prescription handed by the provider to youth um, who are randomized to one website or another um, and doing a comparative effectiveness trial. And just the, some of these people are actually in the room today. This is Robin, this is me. This is Lauren, who I mentioned. Uh, this is Sharon Park. This is Ariana Chow. This is Carl Mingus, who are PhD students. This is Jen Bicicker, who's the exercise person. And this is Caitlin, yes. Um, there's too many Caitlins in my life. This is Kate, Caitlin Reichenberg, um, who actually got um, a paper just accepted from her work with us in the study. But it just gives you an idea how, you know, what started out as very single disciplinary evolved into much larger and larger studies over time. So, what's it take to be a team scientist? Most important thing I can tell you is you need to know your field and you need to be confident about it. You also need to be willing to negotiate. You can't be a newbie on a team and walk in and expect that people, you know, will initially believe you walk on water. Because what will happen is you will rapidly drown. So you have to be willing to negotiate. You have to be willing to think about, you know, not so much what you're getting out of this, but what the team will get out of this collaboration. Be a willing participant. You know, I've done things in my life as part of a research team that I probably wouldn't ask anybody to do. But if it's going to make the project get better, you do it. And you contribute, contribute, contribute. You can't just take. Um, so how do we do this? How do we nurture this in our um, emerging scholars? You know, rigorous training is critically important. You have to know your field. Um, you have to understand the history and philosophy of science and what that means in working in interdisciplinary teams. We try to train you in teams, so those of you who are working as part of research um, studies, you, you're exposed to people with different ideas and different ways of viewing the world. We focus on the clinical issues um, that you know, we tend to know a little bit better than some other people in the team. It's really important to establish 
relationships with clinicians. And that's one of the reasons I'm so glad we have people from the DNP program and the PhD program here, because the, the teams of the future are going to have both. That the DNP people are going to be the clinical experts, and they will be strong members of these teams. And then we need to advocate for systems that support this kind of transdisciplinary research. And I believe that's it. Thank you. I'm